If you have a Bible, we'll continue worshiping the Lord uh, through the word. Uh, we'll turn to John chapter 21, and I'll read that, those two little verses before it. In case you're new to Redeemer, we're making our way through a four-part series, The Week That Changed the World. And this is our third sermon in that series, and we'll finish that up next week. And we'll be looking at uh, Revelation chapter 7. John chapter 20, get, I think it's on page 907 on my Bible. When you got it, you can say amen. I'll start at the two verses before it. So I'll start in chapter 20, verse 30. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the, of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. And after this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. And he revealed himself in this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. And they said to him, well, we will go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore. Yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to them, children, do you have any fish? And they answered him, no. He said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. And so they cast it. And now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. The disciple whom Jesus loved, which we think is John who wrote this book, Therefore said to Peter, Peter, it is the Lord. And when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he had stripped himself for work, and he threw himself into the sea. And the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far off from the land, but about a hundred yards off. When they got out on land, they saw a charcoal fire in place with fish laid out on it and bread. And Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now, none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and he took the bread and he gave it to them. And so with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. Let's pray. Our Father, we would desire to see you. Jesus, we would desire to see you and worship you and learn more about you and your character and your heart. And so we pray that you would use a frail, weak servant to do so. Thank you for the foolishness of the cross. That eloquence does not make hearers hear. That mighty words do not make hearers hear. That reputation and fame of men do not make women and men hear. But you do. You give growth and you give increase by your spirit. And so would you be pleased to get this servant out of the way? May they see Jesus and may we love him more. We pray this in his name. Amen. So there's a movie that I love. It's, it's, the name of the movie is called Taken. And if you've seen the movie Taken, then you know that one of the stars in the movie is a man by the name of Liam Neeson. And in case you haven't seen Taken, I'll frame it up for you here in a second. But uh, it's the story of this little girl. Well, she's a, I think she's a high schooler who goes to Paris after she graduates. And her father agrees to let her go. And so she goes to Paris with one of her best friends and she does what I think most kids do. Our parents say, hey, call me when you make it. Call me when you make it. And she doesn't call them when she makes it. And so her dad is back in the States and he's calling her, calling her. And finally, he gets her on the phone. And when he gets her on the phone, he's like, where are you? Why didn't you call? Well, by this time, she has already landed. She's already been picking up from the airport. She's already got her bags into the apartment where they're staying. And in her mind, they are about to go and explore Paris. But while she's on the phone with her dad, who's in America, her daughter watches her friend be kidnapped through a window in the room adjacent to hers. And she panics on the phone and she screams and says, Dad, 
they're taking her, they're taking her. And the dad says, they're taking who? They're doing what? And she tells her, these men, they've come and they're, they're taking my friend. And he says, baby, I want you to calm down. I want you to get under the bed and I want you to stay on the phone. And you, you're not going to like what they're about to do, but they're about to take you. And, and it's right that those men leave one room and they come in there to get his daughter and they take her. And, and she leaves the phone on. And so the father who's in America can hear everything. And finally, he, he hears his daughter screaming. He hears her tussling. He hears these men in the background. And he notices that someone else has picked up the phone. And he says, look, I don't know who you are or what you want with my daughter. If you want a ransom, I have no money. But what I do have are a very particular particular set of skills, skills that make me a nightmare for people like you. <laughs> if you don't let my daughter go, I will look for you and I will find you and I will kill you. And that's the movie. <laughs> right. The whole movie is him looking for and finding and killing and restoring his daughter. That's not a, a, a that's a popular storyline, right? If you've seen Black Panther, look, I'm going to say it. Look, I've given you all a long enough time to go see it now. Right. <laughs> so if you haven't seen it now, spoiler alert, you just you stuck. You got to stay right. So Black Panther, it's a, a Marvel comic and it, it's been killing the box office. It is amazing. But it's the story of these Wakandans. That's this sort of make-believe African uh, country. And they sit on this, uh, this bed of vibranium. And it's this, the most precious resource in the world. And what happens is, is they send spies out to kind of survey what's happening in the rest of the world. And, and one spy leaves Wakanda and he moves to America. Well, he falls in love with an American woman and they have a child. Well, the king of Wakanda comes in to check in on him, and it's turned out that, that this Wakandan citizen has betrayed the throne, and, and he has done something uh, immoral or unright in the sight of Wakanda. And so he has a kid with this American lady, and, 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 and then th this, this Wakandan is killed in America. Well, this kid is half American and half Wakandan, and he kind of grows up in this shadow. That, that my father was killed and he had uh, um, panther marks in his stomach, right? And so there's this, so fast forward several years that this half American, half Wakandan kid, he finally shows up in Wakanda to challenge T'Challa. And T'Challa is the reigning Black Panther. And he's like, brother, I don't know who you are or where you come from, but, but we can work this out. And all of a sudden, uh, his name is Eric Killmonger. And Eric says, I've lived my entire life waiting for this moment. I've trained a lot. I've killed in America, Afghanistan, and Iraq. I took life, all of this death, just so that I can kill you. And he takes off his shirt, and, he, and he, this guy's just like jacked, right? <laughs> and he has all of these little markings on his body, and, and every marking is rumored to be a, a, an indicator of every person he has killed. And so the, his story, his particular part in Black Panther is about you have killed my father and I will hunt you down and kill you. Halle Berry has a movie out right now called Kidnap. Same thing. Bruce Willis has a movie out right now. Death Warrant. Same principle. You offended me or my family and we will get you. That's a popular storyline in Hollywood. However, there's another story that breaks the mold, and it's a story of a father who had a son, and this father had a son that was betrayed, and he was tried unrightly, and he was mocked, and he was scoffed, and he was beaten, and he was stripped, and he was spit up, spat upon, and he was left for dead on the cross. And you would think that, 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 that the way that father should respond to the great injustice of how his son has been treated, you would think that it would mirror that of the movie Taken. 
you would think that it would mirror the movie of the Black Panther where this father is on this, this rampage to destroy everything that has done injustice to his loved one, and that is not how the father responds. There's a story about this, th th this same son who stays dead for three days and he gets out of the grave and you would think, you would think that this son, when he comes out of the grave, that the way that he would respond to those who killed him is to rain down fury and to pour out wrath. And what you see is he deviates from the storyline. This is not make believe. It's the gospel. It's the Bible that what you see in the Bible is good news is that the father whose son was crushed and killed does not instantly return justice upon his sinners. That Jesus does not come out of the grave with vengeance in his heart, tracking everybody down and giving them what they deserve. He actually does something that would not sell in Hollywood. He actually gives grace. He actually goes towards his killers and does not give them what they deserve. Look, it's Easter. Jesus is alive. I want you to repeat that after me. Jesus is alive. Jesus, is alive. Jesus, has, died Jesus has died on the cross. He has paid for my sins. He, my sins. he was resurrected on the third day. He has, he has ascended into glory and he is returning. <clears throat> Easter, we typically go towards that fact, right? That this is a reality. Here's what I want to do this morning with us. I want to I want to change it. Right. I want to say because Jesus has been raised, what is he like? What is the posture of the resurrected Jesus towards sinners. And see, that's what we get in this passage. This passage comes after the cross. This passage comes after Jesus has been raised. This passage is in a list of things that Jesus would do after he had been raised from the dead. And what I want to do this morning is show me what you're like, Jesus. And here's what we learn in this text by John, that the resurrected Jesus gives tangible grace to those who sin terribly. He gives tangible grace to those who sin terribly and doubt that grace can reach me. Now, the first thing I want us to think through is the, is the disciples and their need for amazing grace. Now, put yourself in the shoes of the disciples, right? The, in, in the Gospels, we realize that Jesus calls them to himself that for three years, they are family. For three years, they eat meals together. For three years, they laugh together. For three years, they, Jesus teaches them. For three years, they play. I mean, the fact that Jesus would come and let little kids come and sit on his lap and say that the kingdom of heaven is full of them, that, that these disciples got to learn from the best. They got to walk with him and, 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 and be in his presence and in his company. Now, that's true. Scripture would say that. But you know what else scripture says? They sold him out. All of them. Judas sold him for money. Peter denied him three times before the crow made a noise, before the rooster crowed. When it was time to pray in the garden, they slept. When he was hauled off, they scattered. When he needed help on his way to be crucified with the cross on his back and he could not carry the cross himself because he had been beaten the night before. When he fell on the ground, a man named Simon had to carry his cross. And guess what? It was not Simon the Zealot and it was not Simon Peter. It was Simon the Cyrenian and Cyrene is in northern Africa. So let me get this right. My savior, your savior is on the way to the cross. And in Jerusalem, his disciples are nowhere to be found. And there happened to be this black African Christian dude who's in Jerusalem during this time. And this African man actually carries his, him to, the, to, 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 to be crucified. Where was his disciples? Nowhere. What about this? When he died on the cross, did one of his disciples go and get his body? No. 
a man named Joseph of Arimathea, who was a secret disciple, decided to make his faith public by going to ask for the body of Christ. And another man named Nicodemus, who always came in the gospel of John to Jesus in the night, that, that, that think about the irony that they had been walking with Jesus for three years. And when the going got tough, they left. And here it is, these other people, Joseph of Arimathea or Nicodemus or Simon the Cyrenian, these old people who not, they're not even in the, in the story. And they're the ones who come up and do justice to his body. And guess who helped him when they were burying Jesus? Women. So get, get this image. The disciples are gone. Strangers are doing right by him. It makes sense then in the, in, the, in, the, in the section before this that after Jesus has been crucified, the disciples had locked themselves up in a room with the door locked. And it says that they were afraid. They were afraid of the Jews. This is the second scene. The second scene, guess where they are now? They're not in a room. Look at what the text says in, in verse 1. They are at the Sea of Tiberias. And what in the world are you doing at the Sea of Tiberias? They want to go fishing. Fishing. Probably going back to the trades that they were doing before Jesus called them. All right, well, it's over for us now, man. We might as well go back and try to go get our jobs back, right? And here's the thing. John tells us Simon Peter was there. Thomas was there. Nathaniel was there. The sons of Zebedee, James and John, and two of his other disciples were together. So seven of them were there. Judas was dead. And four of them, is mi they're missing. We don't even know where the other four are. Now, here's the thing. Where is the Sea of Tiberias? I'm going to show you, Jimmy. All right. You see the little compass sign right there where it says north? You see Judea right above it? Look right up to the right of that. You see Jerusalem. Now. You see where Tiberias is? Way up top. You see the Sea of Galilee and right on the left is Tiberias. You see where they are? They're 70 miles north of Jerusalem. 70 miles north. They got out, right? All right, thank you, Jimmy. To go fish. Now, here's the thing. A clue that they are not in a good place and this is unique to John. John always does this light and dark, daylight and nighttime. See, we know that they're not in a good place because look at what it says. But that night they caught nothing. Think about John. Nicodemus came to Jesus when? In the night. Jesus was betrayed when? In the night. When Jesus was on the cross dying, darkness came across the face of the land. Well, how does John open up his gospel? In the beginning was the word, the word was God, the word was God, the word became flesh and light has shone in darkness and darkness will not overcome it. That in John's gospel, when he says light and darkness, it's not just if the sun is out. He is talking about spiritual darkness. Nicodemus had not yet come into the light. And so he came to Jesus through the night. And so when John says that night, they caught nothing. You want to know what he's saying? Brother, they are in a really dark place. They are 75 miles away from Jesus and they can't even work and catch fish. You see what's happening? Can you imagine what they're thinking? We have just betrayed Jesus. We did not give him a proper burial. We have denied him and sold him out. And here we are 75 miles north of Jerusalem and we can't even fish. You see what the, the scriptures are saying? They're in a dark place. Why does that matter? Can you relate to where they are? That these dark moments in your life when God seems distant and light isn't breaking in and you're going through the motions and you've lost your mojo. You've blown it at parenting. You've blown it at maintaining boundaries in a relationship. Another month where you have not stewarded your money well, you've overspent. Another morning where you've watched too much TV and not enough scripture. Another day when you said you were going to pray for someone and you didn't do it and this has become a pattern. Maybe you grew up in the church all your life and you went to college and you made bad choices. 
And every choice you made, it felt like it brought you farther and farther and farther away from the Lord. Or maybe you're like Frederick Douglass. When Frederick Douglass looked at Christianity in his day, he says, between the Christianity of this land and the Christianity of Christ, I recognize the widest possible difference. And so you're here today because somebody forced you to come. If you're honest, since you left, your life has not been good. You're in a dark place. Maybe you're like the disciples where you look at your life and you look at your heart and you look at your decisions and you look at your behavior and you say, man. I'm far from the Lord right now. And here's what I want to tell you. You've come to the right place. The disciples needed amazing grace. And what this passage shows us is that Jesus has amazing grace to give. Look, I love uh, verse four, and I think it's the linchpin of the text. Look at what it says. Just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore. Think about that image, right? I just told you what darkness meant in John's gospel. And now notice what John says here, just as day was breaking. You hear what John is saying? They're not about to be in darkness for long. That day is going to break. Jesus shows up and he saints he might not come when you want him to. But he always on time. Ain't that right to you? He always on time. And that's what's happening. Think about this. Jesus let them linger in the darkness. He let them go out there in the darkness on the sea and catch nothing. It wasn't like he didn't know where they were. He let them stay there. But then one morning he says, "Okay, enough, enough. We're going to go and I'm going to use the S-U-N to shine the light of the S-O-O-N on my people who are living in darkness. And so on that day, it was two sons working. The sun and the atmosphere was serving the king of heaven to bring light into the darkness of the hearts of the disciples. And so notice, Jesus would have known this all too well. He just was on a cross. He he just was betrayed in the night. He just saw darkness as he died and breathed his last. He's just come out of a tomb for three days. And you know what the scriptures say? His father would not let his holy one see corruption. His father would not leave his son in the darkness. His father says, no, you're going to come out. I'm going to bring you out. And so it makes perfect sense that Jesus does the same thing for his disciples. You're going to be in darkness for a season and you're going to feel the weight of your sin. But here's what I want you to know. Light is coming. The sun is coming and I am going to shine. Now, here's the beautiful thing about the passage. Look at what it says. Jesus stood on the shore and yet the disciples still did not know him. Right. So think about that image. The sun is coming up. Jesus is over there about 100 yards away. And he's talking to you like, man, who is this dude? Why is he out here? What is he up to? And notice what happens. It's possible to be in darkness and for Jesus to be right near you and for you not to see him in your darkness. And here is what Jesus does in the passage. He says, I am going to take the amazing grace of the cross and I'm going to take it from this idea, from this vocabulary word. I'm going to take it from this concept and we're going to make this a reality. We're going to make the grace that flows from the cross of Christ a reality so that we're not talking vocabulary word grace. We're not talking trivial grace. Jesus says, I'm going to put some skin on it. I'm going to put some voice to it. I'm going to put some hands on it so that you can feel me coming towards you. And that's exactly what Jesus does. He starts to make grace look amazing. I think that's what his actions are doing in the passage. Some grace from something abstract to something tangible, from an idea to a reality, from a concept to something they can experience. And here is the thing about God's amazing grace. God's amazing grace pursues people who need it. There's a reason we're given those specific names of men because they show up in John's gospel. They're betrayers. And there's a reason they show up right here and right now. 
that just as as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore. And now notice what this doesn't read. This does not read that Jesus stayed in Jerusalem and called to the disciples. Hey, guys, you come back. You come back. You come back. That's not what it reads. It reads that though they moved away from Jesus, Jesus left Jerusalem to go find them. He found them in their darkness. He went to them at the shore and he called to them. You you see it? If you leave it up to me to come home, I'm not coming home because I know my heart. Right. But we have a savior who's going to come get us and pursue us. That's what you see. His grace pursues. But you also see that his grace is persistent. Right. Look at verse 14 of this section. This was now the third time that Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. So it's not just that he's coming. This is the third time where he chased these rascals down. Third time. This isn't the last time. You read the book of Acts, you know how long he's going to hang out with these dudes? 40 days. 40 days before he ascends to the right hand of the father. That number 40, you've seen that before in the Bibles, right? They wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. When Jesus comes back, he stays 40 days to reassure them. My posture towards you is gracious. I'm not going anywhere. His grace is endearing. Look at verse five. Finally, Jesus talks. Jesus said to them, children, do you have any fish? And they answered him, no. He said, cast a net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. And so now they start this dialogue. But notice how Jesus, what he calls them. He said, look at the first thing that comes out of his mouth. He says, children. Now, look, I'm going to be really honest with you. I'm going to take off my preacher man stuff, right? I'm going to tell you, if, if you, if you crucify me, and you don't have the audacity to come and get my body off of a cross. And when the going gets tough and, and you flee, I'm going to have some words for you. And it's not going to be children. <laughs> he does not call them traitor. He does not call them phony. He does not call them fake. He does not call them sellouts. He does not call them weak. He does not call them any of what they had done. They had done this. They were guilty as charged. They were imposters. And he comes to them. He says, your children, my children. That preaches, right? Because when you're in a dark place, we tend to associate our identity by what we have done and the trouble we've gotten into. But notice Jesus. He looks at them in their darkness and in their betraying, and he still calls them children. Why? Because on the cross, He adopted them into the family of God and he himself paid the price for the adoption. And they are sons and daughters. Amazing grace that serves. Look, they're trying to fish. They're trying to put something on their stomachs. And it says they couldn't even do that. They sat there all night fishing. And so notice what happens in verse six. He tells them to cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. And they did. If you go down to verse 11, it says they caught a lot of fish. And John gives us notice the precision in this gospel. They were about 100 yards off. Notice what it says in verse 11. They counted 153 fish. I mean, come on. I'm going to round it up or something, right? He's like 153 fish. That's how many was in the net, right? But here's the thing. Do not read this and think that Jesus cooked their fish. Don't read this and think that he told them to cast their nets out and then y'all get fish. And then when y'all get fish, you bring your fish to the side and then we're going to eat. That ain't how it reads, right? I know that's broken English, but you get what I'm saying. That's not how this reads. He did not ask for their fish until when? Verse 10, Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have caught. Look at verse 11. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net. Look at verse 9. When they got out on land, they saw a charcoal fire in place with fish laid out on it and bread. 
So come on, y'all, y'all see what's happening? He don't need their fish to feed them. He does not need their fish to feed them this meal that they're about to eat. The Bible says when they got on the shore, guess what was already there? The big green egg and the fresh salmon and the, the whole charcoal briquette. The meal was already being prepared. Now, you will miss the significance of this if you interpret this meal through how Americans view food. You see, in Jewish culture, a meal was the highest statement of fellowship. It wasn't about calories. It was about community. And what Jesus was doing himself, it it reads as if he got there to the Sea of Tiberias with the intent on having a picnic with friends who played him. Breakfast with his betrayers, food with spiritual felons. And guess what? He will be the chef. That on this morning. That the living room. Is the seashore, right? At the ambient lighting is the sun. And the Spotify playlist is the sound of waves and birds. And on the menu is fresh fish and prepared bread. And the method of cooking is charcoal. And the host is Christ. He is inviting them to eat a meal prepared for them by himself to communicate We still have communion. Peter don't even have the right clothes on, right? It says he he had to get clothes on. They stinking. They've been out all night. And Jesus does not say, clean yourself up before you come to my table. He says, dirty, sweaty, tired. Come on. I'm serving you. This entire scene is grace. Grace that pursues, grace that is persistent, grace that calls them not by what they did, but but by who they are in Christ. Grace that serves them. When we see passages like this, may we never, ever flatten grace. May we not simply think that grace is just God's favor towards you. It is that, but it is so much more. It is living and active and real and tangible. Now, here's the question that we have to ask ourselves. This is the third point. What's the purpose of this snippet of grace? Why is this in here? Let me tell you why it's not in here. This is not in here for Bible trivia, right? Just throw me out some names, throw me out some dates, throw me out some people, and I can pass the Bible trivia bowl, right? I'm for that. Our kids need to be memorizing scripture. That's really good. This is not a history lesson. You know, when you take a history class, you got to you got to go. You got to know geography. Where did this take place? You got to know chronology. When did this take place? You got to know who are the characters involved? You know, you got to got to know that. And you can spit these facts out and treat it as history and pass a test. Here is how we're not supposed to read the Bible. This isn't just past history, family. Notice what John writes in the section right before this. Look at chapter 20, verse 30. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in the book. So first thing John is saying, brother and sister, it's so much. This is just a snippet. What we have in the Bible is just a snippet of everything Jesus did. And John would say, man, if we wrote down everything Jesus did, there is no book that could contain it. But he says, but what we have written right here, look at verse 31. These are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. That is an editorial insert. What John has just did when he did this was stop telling us what was happening, and he moves to telling us why he wrote it. Why did he write what we're reading this morning? So that you would believe that this is not just how your Savior treated 
the disciples who betrayed him back there. This is the grace to you now when you betray your Savior, when your sin puts you in a place of darkness. This is the same Savior who gives the same grace because he was crucified on the same cross and what he accomplished on Good Friday has implications for how you live the rest of your life. This is not history, family. This is your present reality that God has tangible grace for you and me. And it looks just like this. Would today be a day where you believe and step out of darkness into his light? Would today be a day that you worship him better and more accurately because now you know what grace is. You know that he pursues. You know that he calls you by that name and not by what you do. He looks at you and he is pleased despite your failures. Would you believe today? That we would respond, right? That, that, that one of the responses after we believe is that we would run towards the one who gives grace. And that's exactly what you see in verse 7. When Peter found out that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment for he was stripped for work and he threw himself into the sea. And the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were about 100 yards off. What you see these men doing is responding to grace. They are moving closer to the one who has grace to give. They are not letting anything, the sea, the boat, it doesn't matter. This distance between where I am and where you are, we're going to shorten that by the spirit because you have grace to give. And that's what Jesus is saying. Come to me. Well, Pastor L, I, I, I did this. There is grace for that. Well, pa well, Pastor L, I did this. There is grace for that. I did this, but there is grace for that. So here's the thing. Let's play this little game right here, right? I'm going to say something, and I'm going to point to you, and I want you to say, but God gives grace. All right? I've committed adultery. I'm a liar. I'm sexually immoral. I covet all types of things and I am not content with where I am and who I am. I've hated the church and I've been away for 10 years. I've hated Jesus and I've hated suffering and I feel like his hand is upon me and his face is turned away from me. See, here's the thing. You always have to let the grace of God have the last say so over your life. If we don't live like that, then why would he go to a cross and die for sinners? But if the grace of God is for real. Whatever you have done. Wherever you have been. It is a comma and it is not a period. And you feel the rest of that sentence with this way. But there is grace that he has purchased for me on Calvary. There's an invitation, family. Respond to grace by coming towards the one who has grace to give. And the last thing you see in this text is that we respond by grace to grace by being sent out. Man, I wrecked my brain over this fish thing, and I think I figured out why the fish thing is here. This is not the first time that Jesus told them to throw out a net and catch fish. Y'all know that, right? In Luke chapter 5, when he was calling the disciples, and he found them fishing, and they fished all night long and caught nothing, Jesus shows up, hey, bro, throw, the, throw, throw it over that way. And when they caught the fish that way, right, they had so much fish, the nets were breaking. Luke chapter 5, go check me on it. And that's, at that point, that's when Peter, he, see, he had one of those Isaiah chapter 6 moments. When Isaiah, Isaiah saw the Lord, he said, whoa, is me. I'm a man of unclean lips and I'm undone. My eyes have seen the Lord. 
Peter has one of those encounters. When Jesus tells him to cast the net over there and they get fish, Peter says, whoa, get back from me. I'm a sinner. And you know what Jesus told Peter? I will make you fishers of men. Now, put that right there. Guess where that happened? On the same lake. Look, the Lake of Gennesaret, the Sea of Galilee, and the Sea of Tiberias, they're all the same sea, depending on which side of the land you entered the sea from. Think about that. In Luke 5, they were commissioned and told, you're going to be my uh, apostles and disciples, and you're going to go catch people. And he shows them with this picture of this fish and this, this abundance of fish that the nets are breaking. He's telling them then right there, you're going to have a fruitful and abundant ministry, right? Now, fast forward right over here. After the cross, after the betrayal, guess where they're back? On the same lake, fishing, and they can't get no, catch no fish. Now, Jesus did not need their fish to feed them. We just said that, right? So what were their fish for? He is recommissioning the same men who betrayed him. His calling to go make disciples and to be preachers of grace, it does not change because they betrayed him. As a matter of fact, when you read the section after this, look at what it says in verse 15. When they finished breakfast, Jesus said to Peter, son of John, do you love me more than these? He says, yes, feed my lambs. You see the connection. He is recommissioning the disciples. And guess what the object lesson is? When I tell you to go cast fish over there, you're going to catch it. And guess what? It says he caught 153 and not one fish broke the net. Know the image? When you rightly preach grace, they will come and I will not lose one of them. Ain't not one of them going to fall through the net. You preach me and you preach amazing grace and the fish are going to come. How do we respond to this grace, family? By one, believing it's for you and me. By two, coming out of our darkness and moving towards the one who has grace to give. And by three, being those who gossip about the amazing grace of God. You see, Easter ain't the only day that visitors need to be in church. You know what I'm saying? Like, if we're going to make Easter a big deal, look, we, every week is Easter, right? Every week is Easter. And so whatever it took to get friends and families here, Jesus is saying, now go do this all the time, not just on a holiday. He says, talk about grace. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we love you. And what a privilege it is to be called children of the King. Father, I pray for those who don't know you that have saw themselves as beyond your reach. Might today be a day where they believe the gospel. For those of us who hear this same story over and over and over again, may we not be bored with it, but may we press deeper into knowing you and walking with you and celebrating what you have accomplished for us on the cross. We love you and we praise you in Jesus name. Amen.